So let's take a look at a few examples, right, which hopefully will make all of this discussion a little bit more clear. Right. I'm going to consider, you know, I'm once again, I'm following the treatment in Kong's paper and also what is done in uh, Parhi's book. Therefore, these labels that are given, right, the design F, design R1, B1, etc., you will see are just basically following exactly that same thing. So the first example that I'm considering is with D equal to 1, 0. What is 1, 0? It's basically this direction. Okay, along the I axis. P transpose is equal to 0, 1. Right. What is important over here is only that P transpose D is equal to 0, which you can check, right? P transpose D 0, 1 into 1, 0, right? The matrix vector multiplication, it basically have 0, 1 into 1, 0 is equal to 0. Okay. And S transpose D in this case is equal to 1, right? The other thing, of course, that you can see from this discussion is that S transpose D cannot be equal to 0 because S transpose D equal to 0 would mean that two operations are being mapped onto the same processor at the same time. And that's not okay. Right? So S transpose D has to be greater than, well, it can be negative, right? Ultimately, what we are interested in is the sign of S transpose D. What does it mean to be negative? It just means that, you know, the direction we chose for our arrows was probably wrong and we need to reverse that. That's all. Okay. But it cannot be equal to 0. So, what we have over here is, you know, the weights, if I go back to this diagram over here, right, effectively what I can see from this diagram is that I have, yeah, the weights vector W is equal to 1, 0. Okay. The x vector goes along this, and this is 0, 1. Okay. I'm going to put a transpose on all of them just to make it easier to write. And this is the results or the output value vector, which is 1 minus 1. Okay. These are the three things that I'm going to consider for all the mappings that I have later. Right. So coming back here, basically what I end up with is this weight vector, which was 1, 0. P transpose E corresponding to that is equal to 0. And S transpose E is equal to 1. Right. So, I mean, basically P transpose E, this is equal to 0, 1, which is P transpose into 1, 0 is equal to 0 and S transpose E is 1, 1 into 1, 0 is equal to 1. Okay, so I'm just doing matrix multiplications in or you know, vector dot products in this case, right? With that, I end up with all of these things, 0, 1, 1, 1 and minus 1, 0. I'm going to show you the resulting diagram next, but before that, let's try and interpret what these numbers mean, okay? So a value of 0 over here, right, P transpose equal to 0, P transpose E equal to 0 means that weights stay on same processor, right, there's no moving from one processor to another, right. What does this mean? It basically means that after one cycle, after each cycle, weights return to same processor, right? So effectively, in other words, this one over here is sort of meaningless. It doesn't really convey anything new for us, okay? The input, on the other hand, right, this one over here tells us the inputs move processor to processor on each cycle. Okay. What about the outputs? Also move processor to processor, but all in the same cycle. Right? In other words, there is no delay involved in 
the output moving from one processor to another. This is slightly weird. I mean, what exactly does it mean? Let's look at the architecture in order to find out, right? This is basically what we are talking about over here, right? What we are saying is the X values, this shift happens on each clock cycle. Okay, the W values remain stationary. And the Y values are, it's basically a combinational addition that happens over here, right, in order to generate the final output. Okay, so this is in the paper, it is referred to as fanin, right? But basically what it means is that this is a sort of broadcast kind of architecture, right? It essentially takes one value and all of them together without having any delay elements, without having any registers in between, in the same clock cycle, they are all combined together in an addition operation, okay? What does an individual processing element do? Like we said before, you know, Z out is W into X in and the X out is a copy of the X in itself, it just basically propagates it to the right side. Okay. Why was this result given as minus one zero? Because basically another way of looking at this would be to say that I have an architecture that looks like this and each of these is a sort of processing element, right? And what I have over here is some zero, right? Which is fed in over here. The X comes in from this side and Y comes out on this side. Okay. So this is essentially exactly what corresponds to this architecture. Right. Let's take this further, look at other similar examples. Right. I'm going to call this as design B1. Once again, in this case, in B1, what happens is that the W, the weights stay in one place. Right. Let's or rather, you know, how did I actually end up with this. Let me look at this. B1 just says that I'm going to use the value B is equal to 1, 0 and therefore P is equal to 0. And same as before, the only difference being that this has changed. Instead of being 1, 1 over here, I'm going to use 1, 0. Okay. What changes? What you can see is that this value, these values over here are the ones that change. Right. So this has now become 0 and this has become 1. Let's see if we can interpret what this architecture would look like. I basically have my processing elements, right? W0 is going to remain over here. W1 is going to remain over here. W2 is going to remain over here, right? The inputs X basically comes in like this, but in the same clock cycle, it also goes over here and it goes over here. What is it that's actually being done over here to with the X? It is just multiplication by the corresponding weight. Right? Now the Y on the other hand is going in the opposite direction, but with a delay element on it. Right? Because of this one sample delay that we have for S transpose E. Okay. What does this correspond to? It basically, you know, uh, if you look at it, this is essentially the so-called direct form two architecture of a filter. So I have X over here. It goes into the multiplication of these values. And finally, what I get out over here is the Y. Okay. So this is essentially, I mean, you could also write this as plus with a zero, but same thing. Right. Ultimately, what is happening is that I have the delays are on the Y path and not on the X path. That's essentially what this architecture looks like. It basically shows that X gets broadcast, right? The same value is being broadcast to multiple different computational units. What is the computation that's happening? Now X and Y are inputs over here. All that happens is the Y is being fed out. Okay. Now, you could also have thought of it as, you know, having one block over here and say that the X that is fed in is also fed out with zero delay. Either way, it doesn't really matter. The point is what computation is actually happening over here. And the fact that there is no delay involved in the propagation of X within the same clock cycle, it basically just floods out to all of them. 
So the one thing that you should you know take a moment and observe at this point is both of these designs originated from the same RTG, the same dependence graph. Okay, just by changing this schedule vector, I got two different architectures. Right, which sort of tells me that maybe I can come up with others as well. And yes, we can. Right, and the interesting thing is many of the re remaining architectures that we think about are not ones that we would normally think about in connection with a filter implementation, right? But it turns out that especially when you are looking at convolutions and other kinds of operations of that sort, it makes sense to also think about these other architectures and they are actually quite useful, okay? So one minus one, what kind of direction is this? It basically is in the downward direction over here, right? P transpose therefore is orthogonal to that at right angles to the D, right? So that P transpose D is equal to zero and S is equal to one zero, right? What happens if I just choose these values? Why did I come up with them? Don't worry about that. You just choose these three values, calculate the P transpose E and S transpose E numbers, right? The weights now need to move from one processor to another. Okay. This is strange. I mean, none of our filter architectures that we are familiar with involve weights moving around. Okay. But if you think about it, right, although for basic dot products and for FIR filters, it doesn't really make sense to do this. It turns out that especially when we start thinking about things like what is happening in convolutions these days, or even if I had to take the same data and put it through multiple different filters, right? Such an architecture might start to make sense because I can actually have a situation where the weights move. I actually have to, you know, take the weights, flush them through the system and then get a new set of weights for the next computation, right? In that kind of scenario, this weights moving may not be a bad option at all, okay? This once again tells me that X is being broadcast, the fact that I have a zero in the S transpose C corresponding to the input, right? And this zero over here for the results tells me that the y values, the outputs are going to be stationary, okay? And this is essentially something that is called output stationary, okay? This previous one is essentially something called weight stationary. The previous, I mean, both B1 as well as the F that I showed before that are weight stationary architectures, right? Why weight stationary? It basically means that the weights remain on the processing element. Whereas over here, the outputs are computed in place and the actual values that need to do the computation come in from outside. What does the hardware architecture for this look like? It's this, right? So you can see this ring out here, right? Which basically is how the W values are going. The W values are getting propagated, right? They're actually going from one side to another. Okay? So on every clock cycle, the W goes to a different uh, processing element. And think about what is happening over here. In the first clock cycle, W1X1 happens over here, right? So Y1 gets the value W1X1, this gets uh, W3X1, and this gets the value W2X1, okay? In the next clock cycle, what happens? This has got X2 over here, right? So this gets W1X1 plus W1, X, uh, sorry, W2, uh, X2, right? What comes over here? This is W1, X2, and this is going to be W3, X2, right? And in the next clock cycle, what I'm going to have is that W3 comes here, W3, X3, right? And this will have uh, W2, x3 and this would have w1 x3 okay so if you look at it and basically see what are the things that are being computed in each place at a given point in time right in this particular case i think what you will find is that you know uh, yeah you also need to sort of take care of when the values get reset so for example in this case this w3 x1 should not be part of this sum and over here, what you would find is that both of these should not be part of this sum, right? This is basically the dot product, right? What is happening over here on the Y2 
it basically means that I've done W1, X2, W2, X3. I need to do W3, X4. The next value needs to get computed, right? Which will happen on the next clock cycle. After that, the Y2 has to once again get reset so that it becomes ready for computing the next thing that's going to happen here, which is basically going to be Y5. Okay, so that is the way in which you need to interpret this. Along with the computations, there is also some, just like for folded architectures, we need to make sure that we reset our accumulating registers at appropriate points in time. Okay. Go further with this. Now, this starts to get interesting. Okay, let's, uh, or rather, I mean, there are a couple of interesting points over here that you need to keep in mind. This is D is equal to 1 minus 1. P is equal to 1, 1. Okay, so far so good. S is also equal to 1 minus 1. The important point, the interesting thing over here is going to be S transpose D. How much is this equal to? 1 minus 1 into 1 minus 1. This is equal to 2. Right? So what does it mean about the hardware utilization efficiency? It's going to be equal to 1 by 2. Right? So effectively, in other words, the hardware units are going to be operating only on half of the clock cycles. Okay. So what this effectively tells us is that I have these weights, I have these uh, inputs. What does the hardware architecture for this correspond to? Once again, the Y values remain stationary because I can see that P transpose E is equal to zero for the Y, right? The X values are moving in the plus one direction and the w values are moving in the minus one direction in other words they are coming from the opposite side okay on every clock cycle basically i sort of transfer the data one thing that you need to keep in mind over here is right because of the fact that the results are changing on only every alternate clock cycle it means that effectively I need to leave this gap between x1 and x2, right? So there's a gap of two over here. What does this mean? Let's look at, for example, what is being computed out here, right? On cycle zero, I'll basically do w1, x1, okay? After that, what will happen? w1 will come here. This one, uh, whatever was the value that, uh, yeah, so in other words, this value x2 will come here, okay, on the next clock cycle. So in the next clock cycle, I'll get w1 x2 on, if I call this p0, p1, and uh, or other p3, p2, and p1, this will happen on p2, this will happen on p1. Okay, and at t equal to 2, what I'll get is the old w1x1 plus mm, yeah, w2x2, right, because by that point w2 would have come, uh, or rather x2 would have come here and w2 would have come into this place. Okay. So if you look at this carefully and go through the time steps that we have over here, basically what you will see is that at t equal to zero, just concentrate on the y1 term, right? At t equal to zero, it performs w1 into x1. The next thing it needs to add in order to get the dot product is w2 into x2, but x2 has not reached yet. And the w2 has also not reached yet, right? I need to wait for an extra clock cycle before those two values reach, okay? Therefore, during the second clock cycle, effectively what is happening on P1 is that P1 is sitting ID. It's not doing a computation. It needs to wait for the data to come through. Okay. What will happen if I did not have that gap? That is if W2 and uh, X2 were you know, already sort of straight away coming through on the previous clock cycle. Uh, I think you'll, okay, I, I, I need to, you know, uh, see how exactly to illustrate this part, but there would be a problem with regard to the dependencies. You know, the, you would basically not be able to get all the computations done in place. Okay, I'll try and write that a bit more clearly. This diagram needs to be done in a slightly cleaner way. If 
represent that. Okay. The point is R1 is one possible design. Similarly, we can also come up with more R2, right? Once again, I'm just choosing more and more strange values for S, right? This basically corresponds to this direction. And this sort of corresponds to some 2 comma 1 is basically 2 in the x di i direction, 1 in the j direction, right? All that it matters is that S transpose D is not equal to 0. As long as I cho choose any S transpose that does not uh, make it equal to 0, I should be able to construct a corresponding hardware architecture. What will this correspond to? Once again, you know, uh, another interesting architecture now where we find that the weights actually sort of propagate with a delay of two cycles. Inputs propagate with one. In other words, on every clock cycle, the inputs basically jump through over here, right? The results also propagate, right? So the y values are also sort of going from one step to another, right? So in other words, every, uh, uh, sorry, the y values are not because the pre-transpose E is equal to zero. Therefore, the y values remain stationary. This is also a form of output stationary. Right? And what ends up happening is the weights and the inputs are moving at different speeds through the system, right? Because they have different number of delays, different time instants at which a given weight arrives at a given uh, processing element. Okay. So this two over here effectively means that I need to wait for two clock cycles before the weight gets transferred into that particular processing element. 